Welcome to the 2018 Davis Market Nickerson Academic Freedom Lecture. Uh, my name is Neil Marsh, and I serve as chair of the faculty senate, uh, and also chair of the Senate Advisory Committee on University Affairs, which is more often just known as SACUA. Um, this annual lecture, which is jointly organized by SACUA and the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund, is dedicated to the defense of academic freedom. Uh, and for nearly 30 years, this lecture has featured distinguished, speech, distinguished speakers from all walks of academic life. This year's speaker, Professor Jean Nicol, continues that tradition. The lecture is named to honor three former faculty members, Chandler Davis, Clement Market, and Mark Nickerson, who were the targets of the McCarthyite witch hunts in the 1950s. In 1954, they were suspended from this university and in the cases of Davis and Nickerson, subsequently expelled for their supposed un-American activities. We're very pleased that Chandler Davis, who's the only living member of this trifecta, is here today and will introduce today's speaker. Many years on from the 1950s, this lecture affirms our faculty's belief that academic and intellectual freedom are fundamental values for a university in a free society. It serves as a reminder that these values and rights which we hold dear are constantly vulnerable to efforts to censor unpopular ideas or to silence criticism by those in power. Not least, they're vulnerable to that most basic of human weaknesses, the simple fear of hearing hard truths that we do not want to face. The protection of academic and intellectual freedom, which faces challenges from both with inside and outside the academy, requires continuous vigilance and courage, as exemplified by Professors Davis, Market, and Nickerson. This is true today just as much as it was in 1954. In concluding my remarks, I must thank the members of the 2018 DMN Lecture Committee. Uh, these are Professors Michael Altsman, Gary Krentz, Kim Kierfort, and Stefan Szymanski, uh, and in particular, the chair of the committee, Professor Joy Beatty, for all their hard work and efforts in organizing the lecture today. Uh, and I should also thank um, Robin Snyder of the Faculty Senate Office for managing all the logistics of the lecture. Um, so that concludes my introductory remarks. I now turn the lectern over to Professor Thomas Moore, who represents the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund, who's going to present some brief remarks on the history of this lecture. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Thomas Moore, treasurer of the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund, and uh, an organization that's charged by the University of Michigan Senate Assembly with orchestrating the annual University of Michigan Senate Davis Barker Dickerson Lecture on Academic and Intellectual Freedom. It is my purpose today to present to you a brief history behind today's 28th lecture in this series which began in 1991. We organized the first 27 lectures and published a book based on the first nine lectures. I'll mention that again in a moment. The initial circumstances that led to our meeting here today was the convening in 1954, as Neil mentioned, of a subcommittee of the Congressional House Un-American Activities Committee, known as HUAC, in Michigan. This committee summoned three young University of Michigan faculty members by, for whom this lecture series is named to testify about their associations, political philosophies, and activities. All three refused to name the individuals with whom they had been meeting and communicating and were summarily suspended by then University of Michigan President Harlan Hatcher. Biologist Clement Market was subsequently reinstated and promoted to tenure. 
the other uh, mathematician, uh, Chandra Davis, who is with us today, uh, and pharmacologist Mark Nickerson were dismissed from the university. All three went on to establish outstanding academic careers elsewhere, the latter two in Canada. The University of Michigan's elected faculty, Senate Assembly, and its executive body, the Senate Advisory Committee on University Affairs, or SACUA, were in existence at that time, as now, but all failed to protect the fundamental values of academic and intellectual freedom of their three colleagues. The university regents and the central administration also did nothing in support of, it, of any form of reconciliation at that time. The National American Association of University Professors, AAUP, censored the university in 1958 for these actions, but lifted the censure in 1959 when the university regents adopted bylaw 5.09, which established for the first time procedures that must be followed before a member of the university teaching staff can be terminated during a term in, for which they have been appointed. Over the years, the university chapter of AAUP and SACUA uh, failed in their attempts to elicit a signi significant gesture of reconciliation to Davis, Market, and Nickerson from the university administration or from the regents. During this period, Adam Kulikow produced a senior honors thesis, a video documentary of the events surrounding the suspension of the three. It was entitled, Keeping in Mind, the McCarthy Era at the University of Michigan. And has been shown to the public on multiple occasions over several years. Copies are available for viewing in the Bentley Library here and the Faculty Senate office. In 1990, 36 years after their suspension, the Senate Assembly, acting as a gesture of reconciliation, established the Davis Market Nickerson Academic Freedom Lecture on, on uh, and intellectual freedom. At the same time, the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund was formed, which became an independent 501c3 organization to raise the funds necessary to support and to organize an annual lecture with the purpose of supporting the highest standards of academic and intellectual freedom. The national and local chapters of the AAUP have supported the AFLF from its beginning in 1991. Uh, in 1991, the inaugural lecture was presented by Robert M. O'Neill, professor of law and founding director of the Thomas Jefferson Center for the Protection of Free Expression at the University of Virginia. Then University of Michigan President Bollinger gave the second lecture in 1992. The first lectures were published in the book, Unfettered Expression, Freedom in American Intellectual Life, edited by Dr. Peggy J. Hollingsworth, who has been president of the AFLF from its beginning. It seems that now there is probably another book that uh, may be in the offing. In 2015, University of Michigan President Mark Schlissel, during his winter commencement address, recalled the 1954 hysteria during the McCarthy area and took the opportunity to educate and teach the graduates, reiterating the owner's events that occurred here then. <clears throat> he concluded his cautionary comments, quoting from the University of Michigan Senate Assembly Resolution of 1990, quote, to guard against a repetition of those events and to protect the fundamental freedoms of those who come after us, end of quote. There has, has as yet been no response from the university regents. For nearly 25 years, the president of the AFLF, the chair of SACUA, and the president 
of the UM chapter of the AAUP worked cooperatively to select and invite the speakers, invite the honorees, and make most of the arrangements for uh, this uh, remarkably successful series. The AFLF has kept alive the remembrance of the suspension of those three honorees, not only to educate all, uh, but to sustain the valuable lessons learned from a dismal period in American history, and also to weave into the fabric of our society those fundamental principles of academic and intellectual freedom for future generations. From its inception, the AFLF has had no permanent or paid staff and has relied on the committed support from faculty senate office staff to carry out the mission to organize and publicize the annual lecture. In close concert with and the direction from members of the AFLF. At the beginning, several Senate Assembly members were also dues-paying members of the AFLF, but unfortunately, surprisingly, few have been members in recent years. Within the last four years, the Faculty Senate Office has gotten progressively more busy and with, with other responsibilities, and it has become a diminished priority with the academic freedom lecture. A revised structure of support is critical to assure the continuance of this, this inspirational series. Of parallel importance is the recruiting of new, younger, like-minded volunteers to sustain membership in the AFL, AFLF and to the AFLF board of directors. In an effort to rekindle University of Michigan faculty ownership, and involvement in this lecture series, this year, SACUA has instituted a six-member committee composed of four members of SACUA plus two members requested from AFLF and charged this new committee with assuming all responsibility for planning and implementing this uh, current event. AFLF is very pleased with the excellent choice of speaker for this year, Gene Nickel, who stands very much in the tradition of previous lecturers. We too see much room for improvement with a new process in continuing these lectures for the future. And we are actively exploring possibilities already. There are many possible reasons for a faculty member's willingness to serve on the Faculty Senate Assembly. Among them might occasionally be a focus on academic and intellectual freedom, freedom, although that is infrequently a compelling local issue. A small fraction of those elected to the Senate Assembly are in turn elected to its executive body, the Senate Advisory Committee on University Affairs, SACUA. However, those agreeing to serve on the AFLF board are universally focused on academic and intellectual freedom and its fragility, especially in times of chaos. And all of the members have also previously served on the uh, Senate Assembly. Couple that uh, influence with the additional poignancy of personal friendships with one or more valued colleagues who faced a challenge to their basic right and lost their academic positions here. As an institution, we faced and failed that challenge. Subsequently, a small group was established, the AFLF, focused on preserving the fundamentals of academic and intellectual freedom and keeping that principle prominently before the university regents, the administration, and the faculty. That small group has turned out to be an effective and critical mass. Any process that may be set any new process that may be set has a high bar to, to meet as set by the 28 years of remarkable success that our annual Davis Market Nickerson lecture on academic and intellectual freedom has enjoyed. Thank you very much.
It's a pleasure to welcome our speaker to the University of Michigan. I haven't always been sure of my own welcome here, but today I'm able to speak in the name of the university, and it's a pleasure to introduce him to you. This is the 28th lecture in the series. There have been more than 27 speakers in the series, actually, 30-some, I don't know exactly, and they've been a worthy assortment of academics. <coughs> Naturally, some were administrators, even one university president, the kind of higher up to whom we address pleas for allowing free speech. I wish more had been from the other side of the scrimmage, those whose academic freedom is under threat. Our speaker today is of both kinds. Gene Nickel has been a dean of law at Colorado and at University of North Carolina. He's even been president of the College of William and Mary, but you know what? He's had to fight for his own freedom, too. I mentioned just one confrontation. For years, as a professor at UNC, he directed the Poverty Center on campus, and on the side, he wrote columns for the Raleigh News and Observer, which were often sharply critical of the state government. With unusual frankness, the governor's office and the leaders of the General Assembly informed the university that if Nickel did not stop writing those articles, either action would be taken against him or the UNC Poverty Center would be shut down. He continued to write the columns, and the threat was carried out to an extent. They got the Board of Governors to kick the center off campus. Well, it uh, changed its name. Much of its work was continued with much the same funding, and uh, uh, some of the results of the work are now in print in Professor Nichols' book, The Faces of Poverty in North Carolina. Well, not in print quite yet, I guess. Uh, uh, the book is promised for December from UNC Press, right? Just out. Is that, but you don't have a copy to wave. To, uh, yeah. <laughs> So we applaud Gene Nichols sticking to his position and finishing his book, and we rejoice at the opportunity to hear his contribution to this lecture series. Thank you, my friend. What an honor to be so introduced. I'm uh, delighted to be at Michigan. I woke up this morning, I'm staying in a hotel just down the road and came downstairs for coffee and uh, was greeted by an array of University of North Carolina basketball players <laughs> who are here for some mischievous purpose. I will just tell you that they are I'm very congenial. They are talented and testy. So uh, I wish you the best with them. Uh, though I'm inclined to say uh, I've had my challenges with the University of North Carolina, but I love the basketball team. So uh, sacrilegious as it may be, let's just say go heels. I'm also uh, delighted to be in Ann Arbor. I'm a devotee of public universities. To be at what may be the best public university in America. There could be argument on that in some quarters, I'd guess, but the list of claimants would have to be very, very abbreviated. And perhaps more grudging, I've been dean at two public law schools that were disproportionately populated by students who were undergraduates at the University of Michigan. It's a frustration to all law school deans how unfailingly alumni cling to their undergraduate institutions with their hearts and, as important, their pocketbooks. No one remains more loyal on this front than the Wolverine, so I bid you reluctant tribute. I should add, too, that this deep and unbreakable affection with Michigan alumni seems to thrive even after the 
former Attorney General of the United States between chants of lock her up, explained that Michigan is a prime example of an institution complicit in a pervasively threatened freedom of speech where students are coddled and actively prevented from scrutinizing the validity of their beliefs, transforming this university into an echo chamber of political correctness, a shelter for fragile egos. I'm guessing that our former attorney general ought to come to Ann Arbor and visit a class or two. I uh, think it might do him some good. I know well, too, for example, that in this building, this very building, is one of the world's great law schools. There are known coddlers here. The former attorney general could have used a little additional legal training, especially in the 14th Amendment. But uh, thankfully, that's not my topic this day. I'm especially moved to be asked to deliver this remarkable lecture. It is astonishing to me to think that almost 30 years ago, Bob O'Neill and Lee Bollinger, old friends of mine, uh, delivered the first two of these. None of us is as young as she or he used to be. But the Davis Marker Nickerson lecture on academic and intellectual freedom is a remarkable institution sustained by longstanding academic freedom fund that we've just learned of, a faculty senate invitation for which I'm immensely grateful, affirming three decades ago as I read it that academic and intellectual freedom are fundamental values for a university and a free society. They form the foundation of the rights of free inquiry, free expression, free dissent that are necessary in the life of a university. And with your permission, I too want to offer a word of tribute to Professors Davis, Markert, and Nickerson, particularly Dr. Davis, who is with us and has been so kind in introducing me. When Michigan Congressman Kit Clardy, Michigan's McCarthy by reputation, brought the House un American Activities Committee to Lansing in 1954, he and his colleagues inflicted powerful wounds on Chandler Davis, Clement Markert, and Mark Nickerson when they refused to testify out of constitutional conscience. They were immediately suspended by the university. Davis and Nickerson were fired, punishing these great academics, their families, this university, and this nation. They were of steely and resilient heart Dr. Markert left Ann Arbor, became a distinguished member of the National Academy of Sciences, department head at Yale. Ending his career, it pleases me to think, as distinguished university professor just 20 miles down the road from me at North Carolina State. Mark Nickerson, fired here despite his tenure, became department head in pharmacology at McGill, an internationally accomplished scholar and president of the Pharmacological Society of Canada, as with Dr. Davis, showing for neither the first nor the last time how Canada frequently prospers from our foolish un-Americanism. With Dr. Davis, I pause for a moment. On June 25th, 1957, Judge Wallace Kent held Michigan mathematics professor Chandler Davis, a United States Navy veteran, in contempt of the Congress for refusing to answer 26 questions because they infringed his First Amendment rights. Judge Kent, a Michigan law school grad, sentenced Dr. Davis to six months imprisonment. The Sixth Circuit affirmed the ruling. The United States Supreme Court denied cert. Justices Black and Douglas in dissent. Professor Davis's sentence was served at the Federal Penitentiary in Danbury. He was there after blackball from the American Academy, spending eight years, as he put it, in limbo, immigrating with his immensely accomplished spouse, 
Dr. Natalie Davis, who gave this lecture, I think, two years ago. That one would have been worth listening to. And then who was eventually hired as a tenured professor of mathematics at Toronto. Can I say that this courage, academic, intellectual, physical courage, is rarely seen in American life. A different, even meaner, more fearful time. A panic sweeping the nation. The United States Supreme Court failing miserably in its central duty. Justice Minton writing in Adler against New York only two years earlier that government has the authority to protect young minds from the disease of alien ideologies, such as communism. Prison bars slamming shut, jobs lost, careers ruined. Knowing the fateful and long-lasting cost which was coming, accepting it, rather than surrendering the defining human characteristic of intellectual freedom. I doubt that I could do that. Heroism is sometimes tough earned, too tough. We live in unyielding debt to Chandler Davis, Clement Market, and Mark Nickerson. In my field, we study the great figures of Supreme Court jurisprudence. Marshall, Brandeis, Holmes, Harlan, Warren, Brennan, Marshall again, Ginsburg. But the Constitution itself is not self-triggering. It often requires blood and sacrifice and bravery for its implementation. Davis, Marker, and Nickerson joined the company of our greatest constitutionalist, Scott, Gideon, Hamer, King, Windsor, Reverend Delane of Clarendon County, South Carolina, Barbara Johns of Farmville, Virginia. The list astonishes. Robert Kennedy said not long before he was shot that the future belongs to those who can blend reason, passion, and courage in a personal commitment to the ideals and enterprises of the American democracy. Professor Davis, we are honored to be in the same chamber with you to my chosen topic. <laughs> to my uh, chosen topic, academic freedom, faculty expression. Today, where across much of the country, a new politics reigns while bringing old school challenges of censorship and suppression. It's hard to know where to begin on this front. It's like Lily Tomlin said, no matter how cynical I get, I can't seem to keep up. <laughs> Though I'm perhaps uncertain about how to launch, it is clear where I'm supposed to begin. My chancellor and my provost ask that I first explain to any audience in explicit terms that I do not speak for the University of North Carolina. <laughs> to be candid, after several years of struggle with university leaders, a board of governors, a governor, a general assembly, after my poverty center was closed by the UNC Board of Governors and the same fate was shared by our Civil Rights Center, such a disclaimer hardly seems necessary. I'm barely allowed to speak at the University of North Carolina, much less for it. But the university I love, takes great solace when I offer it full opportunity to distance itself from me, which I do officially now. And since this is a free speech lecture, I'm compelled to concede that I know of no free expression theory that would allow a university to demand that one, but only one of its 3,500 faculty members be required to register that he doesn't speak for his institution. Still, I viewed it as something of an honor to be thus singled out, and the rough truce is on some level fair enough. I don't speak for the University of North Carolina, and as it deals disingenuously with its athletic and academic scandals, it does not speak for me. I will add, as an introductory aside, that I've had some 
application issues arise about this disclaimer. The disclaimer is supposed to be both oral and in print. So I wondered how broadly it applied. When the provost first brought it up, I had just weeks before published articles in the Harvard Journal of Law and Policy and in the Duke Journal of Constitutional Law. So I asked, am I supposed to put a disclaimer on those two? Of course not, my bosses explained. No one gives a shit what you write in some Harvard Journal. <laughs> Nobody in North Carolina reads that. It's only when you publish in the Raleigh News and Observer that you need to explain that your employer detests you. Of course, I paraphrase. <laughs> but proof once again that academic journals aren't uniformly held in the same high esteem that we might choose to afford them. This lecture series, over three decades, has included many of the nation's great First Amendment scholars. That to be candid is not me. I'm a reasonably accomplished federal courts scholar, so if this were a series on the power of the, our national tribunals, I might have modest call on an invitation, but I think I'm here in a different capacity, more perhaps as a practitioner of academic freedom or the protections it triggers or the expression rights in manners of public policy discourse that might be said to attach to it. I also have, over a long career, been on both sides of the calculus, as Chandler said, as a speaker, a writer, a researcher, a lawyer, and an advocate, but also as a dean and as a president and as an administrator, seeing sometimes the tensions that arise in those quarters. To hint at the point, my first teaching position was at West Virginia University, a marvelous place that I fell in love with immediately. One of my old colleagues from WVU reminded me a couple years ago that early on, now some 35 years back, I had given a lecture taking what was regarded by some as a controversial position, that we no longer needed tenure in the academy, or at least in state universities, because uh, the First Amendment and its protections had become sufficiently robust that the important work done by tenure could be carried out effectively in the courts. So perhaps we didn't need the ancient property-based protection after all. My former colleague reminded me of this earlier foolish position and noted somewhat ironically that in the intervening decades, I seemed to have needed the protections of tenure more than anyone he'd ever heard of. <laughs> it occurred to me on this front, like so many others, that I was now grateful not to have had my early wishes granted. I've rarely managed to know what was best for me, but after battles with coal company donors in West Virginia, a president and board of regents in Colorado, a legislature and board of visitors at the College of William and Mary, a governor and general assembly in North Carolina, I have had a modest change of heart about the value of academic tenure. Be careful what you ask for. I could add, too, that two weeks ago, I was on a panel hosted by the faculty at Chapel Hill, which focused on outside interference at the law school. There were four panelists. Two were tenured faculty. The other two were non-tenured professional staff members. Each of us had been harassed in various ways by the Board of Governors. Of course, the two tenured faculty members spoke as present employees of the University of North Carolina. The non-tenured staff spoke as unemployed former staff members. I should say a word about what my focus will be, political interference with academic freedom and free speech, and most centrally, maybe even a subset of that, legislative and political interference with publication, study, inquiry, and research designed to explore the efficacy or the propriety of various governmental policies and practices. 
The interference, I'll suggest, may trigger institutional and curricular concerns of academic freedom, or it may touch on individual liberties of speech and expression. But whether labeled as academic freedom or intellectual liberty, or both, like the title of this lecture series mirrors, the attempt to limit and curtail expression, research, teaching, and publication, or to alter it, or to impose a regime of orthodoxy upon it, because the expression is critical of exercises of governmental power or predisposition and threatens character and essential qualities both to universities and vibrant democracies. Such interference sins against both our public academic institutions and our appropriately heralded form of government. It is a foundational transgression, no matter which name you slap on its forehead. The threat of such core intrusion, I'll claim, on the public university and on American democracy is more substantial than I would have thought. Government officials are not as embarrassed to pursue it almost 65 years after Professors Davis, Marker, and Nickerson's travails as you would think they would be. And though the dangers may be somewhat localized for the moment, it is not unlikely that they will grow in a new political age. I'll also argue that our resistance to unacceptable intrusion is less robust and uniform and steely than I would have assumed. Public universities, even strong ones, are not as well positioned to resist such core violations of our mission and meaning, given our broad-ranging prowess, as one would think we would be, in fact, as we are required to be. Some of the reasons for that are inherent, maybe structural, baked in, public education being tied even here at the famously independent University of Michigan to legislative prerogative and less frequently largesse. But some of the weaknesses are self-inflicted as well. In the incentives we embrace, the way we select and seek out board members and trustees in those systems which allow university participation and selection, in the ways that we choose and compensate university leaders, often distancing ourselves from academic norms, commitments, and attainment, in the frequent marginalization and fragility of faculty governance. As a result of this combination, this complex stew, one of our central roles in learning and in democratic decision-making is more potently threatened than is healthy and acceptable in the second decade of the 21st century. And even as we open doors of opportunity widely and press amazing horizons of discovery and complete capital campaigns that astonish the world, we are perhaps weaker, more vulnerable on central fronts than we should be. I've thought some, I'll concede, about steps we might take to shore up our defenses. But my main goal here is a more modest one. My real claim is that on a central front of our very purpose, our job definition, we are not as strong as we typically assume, and we're not as strong as we are required to be. I should say, too, that unlike most of the free speech and academic liberty issues that roil our campuses, and sometimes our legislatures, and our courthouses, including this one, the issues that I'll focus on are not typically questions of wrenching analytical complexity. They are more frequently measures of will. When a university is sued for developing and implementing harassment and bullying policies, the dispute usually presents competing and colliding essential constitutional values of equality and expression. When a faculty member or a graduate student participates in an expressive boycott and refuse a requested recommendation, speech and equal protection guarantees can meet head on. 
Perhaps the collision can be avoided, but it's not always easy work. On the challenges that I'll posit, it's often not difficult to figure out what constitutional accountability in its order recommends. It is just harder on occasion to pull it off, and even to pull it off on some core and defining fronts. It's also why this lecture, rooted as it is in expressive and intellectual courage, might be a good forum to bring such questions to the table. I draw on experience as an administrator, either a dean or president, at three strong public universities with different organizational structures in different parts of the country, with different political dynamics. I'm not much for university rankings, but two of them are regularly listed as among the top six public universities in the United States. And one, I'm not hesitant to say, is a great and defining public flagship with a storied history, beloved in its state, home to great intellectual attainment with hundreds of thousands of loyal alumni, folks who are massively accomplished, who are disproportionate in the corridors of power, and which, perhaps most surprisingly, has a distinctive and significant legacy in the protection of academic freedom. The University of North Carolina, whose most famed president, Frank Porter Graham, told a seething board of trustees in 1936 who had moved to fire Dr. E.E. E. Erickson for dining in a Durham hotel with the NAACP leadership. Graham responded, if Professor Erickson has to go on the charge of eating with another human being, then you're gonna have to take me first. And whose chancellor, William B. Aycock, defiantly told the legislature in demanding repeal of its speaker ban in the early 1960s. It would be far better to close the doors of the university than to let a cancer eat away at the spirit of inquiry and learning, as you demand. But in the last five years, neither that power base, that abiding affection, that level of attainment, or that proud history of intellectual freedom has stopped the University of North Carolina from surrendering whimperless, essentially without objection, before surprising and indefensible intrusions on academic freedom and free expression, especially those which are aimed at exploring the propriety and effectiveness of various government policies and practices. I fear that our shortcomings may not be idiosyncratic and that they may pose broader challenges for public higher education as a whole. So to briefly illustrate, in 2015, the Uni University of North Carolina Board of Governors, carrying out the demands of their legislative overseers, closed the completely privately funded Center on Poverty, Work, and Opportunity, where I was the director, because it published articles and reports critical of the General Assembly's poverty policies. Not to put too fine a point on it, I had been threatened a half dozen times by legislative leaders, occasionally reduced to writing by my superiors, that if I didn't stop publishing articles in the Raleigh News and Observer critical of the legislature, the center would be closed. Senator Bob Rucho, who played a major role in appointing the board, and oddly sat in the audience as they cast their vote to close the center, keeping a close eye on his charges, told the local papers it was necessary to close the center because, quote, Nickel was advocating anti-poverty measures the legislators disliked. The president, the chancellor, the provost knew fully of the threats and their fulfillment. They had helped to relay them, but they raised no objection. The same year, my colleague, Omid Safi, a much accomplished religion and politics scholar at UNC, left Chapel Hill to become the head of Islamic studies at Duke, a terrible sin, explaining his departure stemmed from censorship by the UNC administration. Safi told the newspapers, we started to see a very chilling impact on professors. 
No one at UNC had ever objected to anything I'd written about human rights violations in Iran or Saudi Arabia or Turkey. But when I started to write about human rights violations from the hands of the North Carolina legislature, I was told in no uncertain terms that campus leaders were fearful the legislature would cut the budget, so the publication needed to stop. In late 2015, and then again in 2017, after I'd continued to publish articles in, about North Carolina poverty policy, the legislature took up what it referred to on the floor as the Gene Nickel Transfer Amendment, cutting $3 million from the law school's budget. The Senate adopted the measure, but it was dropped in conference. The next session, the Senate passed a cut of $4 million, 30% of the law school's state appropriation, under the same listed theory. The cut this time was reduced in conference to $500,000, but became a permanent part of the budget. In September 2017, the Board of Governors voted to ban the UNC Civil Rights Center from becoming involved in litigation. This center, once again, totally privately funded, founded by famed civil rights lawyer Julius Chambers, had for almost a decade represented low-income clients in civil rights actions. The leading movement from the board explained he would have felt differently if the center concentrated its civil rights claims on the Second Amendment. Board members also asserted that they disagreed with the law faculty's assessment of the pedagogical value of clinical experience. The president and chancellor and provost again raised no objection to the intrusion. Meantime, history scholar Jay Smith, who had written a book critical of UNC's handling of the NCAA scandal, had a popular course on athletics in higher education canceled because of, quote, blowback from the athletic director and football donors. The history faculty protested, and the campus faculty grievance committee sided with the history department claiming a violation of academic freedom. The chancellor reversed the committee for ludicrous reasons. Now this admittedly presented no legislative overreach, but it again indicated the tattered nature of the chancellor's concept of academic freedom. That's the stick, then there's the carrot. In 2016, the legislature created the North Carolina Policy Collaboratory at UNC Chapel Hill with an unrequested $5 million appropriation. The Senate Majority Leader said he expects the collaboratory to produce environmental research on North Carolina issues that is more congenial to the deregulation goals uh, of the North Carolina legislature, more congenial than the internationally recognized scholarship of UNC's Institute for the Environment which he reported has too many Democrats. The collaboratory will not be under the control of academic affairs in Chapel Hill. It will carry UNC's name, but not its rigor. The chancellor agreed to the program and hired Senator Berger's top aide to run it. Consider our environmental challenges cured. Carolina's programs for teaching, research, and service had thus been modified, ended, or created to diminish disagreement with the General Assembly. The alterations had been enthusiastically embraced or initiated by the Board of Governors. They'd been, with almost complete uniformity, adopted and facilitated by the President, Chancellor, and Provost. We now reserve academic freedom for orations on University Day. We agree, in effect, to praise, rather than to challenge, the work product of the state legislature. We surrendered quickly and with ease. That's not totally unheard of in my experience. Shortly before my term was ended at William & Mary, the Virginia legislature summoned members of the Board of Visitors, whose tenures they had to sign off on, to Richmond to be grilled about decisions I had made seeking to protect students' First Amendment rights. 
The lawmakers demanded I change my position or be fired. Within days, board members complied. Now, unlike in North Carolina, these weren't efforts to shield the legislature's own work product. But like their colleagues to the South, they weren't slowed down by the likes of the First Amendment. And looking at least a little more broadly, analogous legislative and governmental tampering with academic independence has occurred in Arizona and in Maryland and in Louisiana, there in separate actions taken at LSU and then against publicly funded measures at Tulane and from another direction at George Mason University in Virginia. And now, too, a growing array of states, including my own, have enacted versions of a national advocacy group's campus free speech law. Ours is entitled Restore, Preserve, Campus Free Speech Act. I understand a similar measure has been flirted with here. Among its other notable challenges, the statute empowers governing boards to regulate, quote, administrative and institutional neutrality with regard to political or social issues. Now there's some tight and precise free expression language. I remember being called to the office of the Speaker of the House in Virginia after I had refused to ban a controversial performance from the William and Mary campus. The Speaker explained he was outraged I had made such an overtly political decision. I told him that I thought it was a clear and straightforward constitutional demand, not a political one. He replied that anything that made the Speaker of the House mad was by definition political. I'd also say when I read in the newspaper that the UNC Board of Governors under this new statute had been given expanded authorities to regulate freedom of expression across the state, I thought I must have picked up a copy of The Onion by mistake. I'd rather have Joe McCarthy and J. Edgar Hoover cast lots to decide my First Amendment rights than the UNC Board of Governors. Not all I fear except Justice Jackson's claim that if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official high or petty can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or matters of opinion. The fixed star wavers and meanders. On occasion, it disappears from view. If the last decade has taught us anything, it is that there are fewer fixed stars, fewer uncontested consensus-based constitutional standards and patterns of behavior than we might have supposed. Who would have thought, for example, that a dominant political party would take as a central agenda point the suppression of the effective exercise of the right to vote? Who would have guessed a large segment of political leadership would overtly seek to limit the political participation of African Americans without shame or embarrassment, returning to aims seemingly barred 50 years ago? Who would have thought that a president of the United States would seek to repeal the first sentence of the 14th Amendment and then claim the power to overturn it, whether it was repealed or not? Who would have guessed, as in my own state, we would overtly work to cast aside independent judicial review. Fewer things, it seems, are givens. There's a great old Springsteen song that I love called A Long Walk Home. It says, you know, the flag flying over the courthouse means certain things are set in stone. Who we are, what we'll do, and what we won't. Fewer things are set in stone. Now it is apparently thought that a legislature might appropriately censure those who study and criticize its policies and enactments and purchase university research that is more congenial to its goals, and that university leaders would stand silently by as it happens, rejoicing in the splendor of unfolding capital campaigns, unworried about the meaning of the university. In 1964 in North Carolina, when Chancellor William Aycock was aggressively challenging this legislatively opposed speaker ban. 
The lawmakers threatened his dismissal. Aycock responded on the floor. Even more surprising is the constant admonition directed to those of us who speak out that we should be quiet. This brings a new dimension to our representative form of government. There is nothing in the history of this nation to support the idea that the merits of legislation cannot be discussed in full measure. Neither the decisions of presidents, nor governors, nor Congress, nor the General Assembly, nor the courts have ever enjoyed the immunity suggested for this legislature. That was 60 years ago. You wouldn't think it would need to be repeated today. Still, if it's at least modestly predictable that lawmakers would try to demand such immunity, what about trustees and boards of governors? Those who are first and predominantly, according to the Association of Governing Boards of Universities, charged with the core obligation to, quote, sustain and advance the university's mission, traditions, values, and reputation. Why their complicity? I grew up as a university administrator in the University of Colorado system, a system that elects its board members in statewide and congressional district races, one of, I think, only four that do so, including Michigan, where you have, blessedly, some enforceable markers of independence as well. Keep them while you can. Nebraska and Nevada round out the electoral list. I have no idea, actually, how electing regents works elsewhere. But in Colorado, we were convinced unanimously, and by that I mean to the person, that election of regents was the worst possible way to choose a governing board. In Colorado, the practice of voting on office holders was revealed by polls that fewer than 2% of the population knew anything at all about the people they were voting on. Anything, any single characteristic or predilection. And since the regents were a subset of junior politicos, they tended to assert their prerogatives in improbable and unbecoming ways. I doubt that happens here. But Colorado's regime man managed an odd combination of electoral participation and complete unaccountability. But I've learned a little bit since leaving Boulder, the worst possible way to select a governing board, particularly if you're concerned about legislative interference with academic freedom, of course, is to have a governing board selected by the legislature itself, like we have in North Carolina. One of only two states, as I understand it, to have governing boards handpicked by legislators. On our 28-member board, five are former legislators, another five are lobbyists dependent on the legislative leadership for their livelihoods. Many more have close business relationships with legislators. 23 are men, almost all are white, only one is a Democrat. Legislators now routinely sit in on board meetings. If board members displease important lawmakers, they are replaced. This is not a structure that reeks of independence. Even in a more sensible system, politics can't be completely removed from trusteeship. The role of higher education in American life is too critical for that. As the Association of Governing Boards reports, the vast majority of public trustees at universities are appointed by the governor and confirmed by the legislature or elected directly by the legislature or the citizens. Many are chosen for their political connections. And even with visible declines in state support, public universities remain owned and affiliated state entities. So a lot of this is built in, though my remaining chancellor friends report that smaller, more nonpartisan boards do the job best with the least dangers. In the Kansas system, for example, the nine board members are appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate, but no more than five can come from the governor's party. Partisan politics is thus more readily checked at the door. But in the systems where I've worked, where universities do have more say in the selection process, 
even if the actual choice is made by public officials, like at William and Mary or at the campus level of trustees at Carolina, we've tended to shoot ourselves in the foot as well. This paints with a very broad brush, but when universities are afforded input in the selection process, we've often exercised a decided, almost desperate affection for wealthy business folks with visions of massive charitable donations dancing in our heads. Can I just say from experience that there are few audiences less favorably disposed to claims that there are more important values to be secured in public higher education than money, than conference rooms full of older rich people. I don't know precisely why that is, or maybe I do, but a keen focus on potential donor relations is not an assured formula for protecting core values of academic liberty and integrity. And I could add, parenthetically, as one who thinks that the largest challenge for the American Academy is access for low-income and middle-class Americans, so I was delighted to learn of Michigan's Go Blue guarantee. But broadly speaking, I'm convinced that the endless search for abundantly wealthy trustees to help govern our institutions has served to diminish meaningful access to public higher education in the last three decades. We shouldn't be surprised this is so. In the places where I've worked, it's almost impossible to imagine a low or middle income person sitting on a board of trustees. And that can't be because we limit ourselves only to those who know something about higher education, because we don't. Finally, our administrators, presidents, chancellors, provosts, sometimes even lowly deans. I'll be frank to say that as I watched the UNC Board of Governors debate whether to eliminate the programs of the Civil Rights Center, completely privately funded, founded by a distinguished academic under faculty mandate, in existence for over a decade, beloved by law students and civil rights lawyers, and most of all by the low-income communities they served, with political hacks on the governing board arguing about whether civil rights in the Tar Heel State ought to be limited to the Second Amendment, whether despite accreditation dictates, clinical education ought to be allowed in state law schools, whether a law school curriculum is better set by a system-wide committee of non-academics than the law faculty. As I watched these discussions, followed then by a near unanimous vote to end the work of the center, I thought much about the fact that the president of the university never uttered a word. She sat mom, invisible. After the vote, she issued a statement which, even when parsed dozens of times, left readers utterly flummoxed in their efforts to discover whether she was for or against the closure. If overt, gigantically uninformed, outside partisan tampering with the law school's instructional curriculum, even after being warned against it by the accrediting agency, isn't enough to stir a university president to action, or at least comment, I'm unsure what would. Now these days, there's ample reason, I'll concede, for any North Carolina president to fear for her job because of partisan tampering. Even one who rode in on a Bush Republican revolt can now be ushered out without ceremony by even more interventionist Trump Republicans. Still, as with board selection, I worry that there's a bit of something else going on here as well. The Chronicle of Higher Education reports a remarkable number of public university presidents make over a million dollars a year. The latest list I saw included Arizona State, Texas, Texas A&M, Florida, Indiana, Penn State, Ohio State, Iowa. It's probably light by now. UNC's president makes almost a million dollars, 13th highest in the country, even while sitting in silence. Richard Vetter, director of the Center of College Affordability, has argued that once compensation becomes extraordinarily high, 
it can serve to inhibit rather than to foster effective leadership. Chancellors and presidents, the theory goes, are less inclined to act boldly or operate with required candor and fealty to academic values when it might cost them millions of dollars, they'll be unlikely to command again if they are dismissed. The impact can be amplified by deferred compensation packages, requiring that presidents stay a long time in office before the biggest paydays emerge. Vetter claims astronomical compensation accentuates the tendency of university presidents to avoid taking stands and running the risks of annoying critics. There's an argument, he says, that the, quote, key to being a successful president is to offend the minimum number of people possible, but that may not be the best policy to meet the needs of a university for the future. I'm not certain Vetter is right, but I suspect that he is. One aspect of running a university as a business might be that you get a business. You aren't likely to find members of the Million Dollar Club standing fast on the ramparts. And in Chapel Hill, looking at our long string of leaders from 1930 to 2018, it's easy to defend the claim that the more we've paid, the less we've gotten. Understand, I am not saying that academic freedom and independence, that its sky is falling. It is dramatically weakened in some places, including my own, but hopefully they don't represent the nation at large. It is possible that the tremors will subside. But it's also true that when you probe the bulwarks and guarantees upon which we have traditionally relied, they are markedly less stout, less robust, than we might have understandably believed. I know at least they are less assuring, less effective than I would have assumed, even one who has had occasion to have his eyes opened on such matters. They are less assuring than they are required to be. Our great public universities are marvels of the world. Public serve, as I read, over 70% of the students in American higher education. They constitute our present, our past, and most decidedly, our future. They prosper, thankfully, on an astonishing array of fronts, but on this core defining mission for public universities, for constitutional democracies, threats can appear, protections can weaken. Matters thought carved in stone become blurred or can be blasted away. We ignore such challenges at our peril. Public universities cannot thrive without a vibrant, secure, and zealously guarded sanctuary of intellectual freedom. And democracies cannot meaningfully function, at least this one can't, without rigorous, skeptical, probing, unfettered, unfearing, and sometimes even annoying public universities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, Gene, you're a good dinner you. mate. <laughs> If you do not speak for UNC, who does? <laughs> Is it just the chancellor, her administration, the board, or perhaps all of the faculty excepting you? Well, and that, you know, uh, that's a, that can be a silly or almost a flippant question, or it can be a serious one as well. I know uh, one of the reasons we have faced the challenges that we presently face we have this monument on, you may have read about on our campus, uh, Silent Sam, uh, which has led to an array of challenges, which of course uh, should, have, should never have been placed there, but it surely should have been removed 50 years ago or more. One of the reasons for the difficulty of that challenge and its hardship has been the absolute refusal of 
campus leaders, system leaders, to say anything about it, to take any position on it whatsoever. So every single member of our university community passes and has strong opinions about uh, this uh, monument, uh, and yet we have a silence above which chills. We also have uh, uh, a remarkable silence across the board. I, I'm, I look at it a little oddly, but you may not have read about this, but the university, excuse me, the state of North Carolina is going through an interesting set of challenges. Challenges include the stoutest war on low-income people ever waged uh, in modern times, anyway, in the United States. Uh, I encourage you to read more about it. The stoutest war in modern times in the last three decades on people of color. Our campus is gigantically silent on this matter. Uh, it takes uh, no position. It is neutral on whether or not the state of North Carolina can be completely destroyed, uh, and it thinks that's uh, required. Now, on the other hand, we have public leaders who speak for North Carolina. Uh, we have a United States Senator, Richard Burr, who uh, said on the floor of the Senate uh, about eight years ago that uh, uh, the parents of children seeking Medicaid coverage, uh, poor dramatically poor people all across North Carolina, were hogs at the trough. Uh, he speaks for North Carolina, I guess. Uh, our other United States Senator, Tom Tillis, uh, has explained that what we really need to do is uh, divide and conquer. We need to develop a set of policies uh, so that that woman on, who has several palsy will look down on and despise somebody who has run on purported hard luck and has to be on welfare or food stamps. We need to divide and conquer. That's the goal of his administration. A remarkable statement about uh, what North Carolina is, a remarkable statement about the view of politics. I, I don't know how, why John Kennedy didn't put that in his inaugural address when you're thinking about uh, the purposes of uh, American life and government. Um, we powerfully need, we've had it some, this has led a little bit to a resurgence in uh, uh, faculty governance, uh, in uh, statements about the prerogative and the essential nature of the university itself. But most of our academic leaders are terrified. Now, I, I guess you could say they got reason to be. We, we fire presidents and chancellors. Uh, but if you have no leadership whatsoever, you are uh, left open to decimation, which is our present circumstance. And uh, my own view is if you're not gonna do anything, you don't need a million dollars to do it. Uh, we could hire someone for minimum wage to be president of the University of North Carolina. Yes, ma'am. Professor Nickel, um, as one of your students, in 1980 from WVU Law School. Hello. Hello. Great to see you after 38 years. Um, what do you suggest as a way to increase academic freedom? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, I think uh, it's important to understand that these challenges require the engagement, which has been sort of back of these discussions, uh, when you think about the challenges of academic freedom here, when you think about them on my own campus, they're not easily defeated or pursued in the courts. Uh, in part, that's because the structures can make that challenging. Uh, they are widely respected and believed in by faculties uh, across the universities in which I've worked. Uh, and they are not generally uh, held in great uh, prowess and regard by a lot of the rest of folks. So I think that means that uh, faculty members have to teach and have to engage in 
the traditions of uh, university uh, governance and leadership. I think we also have to recognize that given the broad move of academic leadership that is not happening and is probably not going to. Uh, the more and more we select chancellors and presidents who are trying to emulate the business world or who just make gigantic amount of money, it's just not sensible to think they are gonna stand tall for the most potent values that lie behind uh, university life if it's gonna be costly. Um, and yet we tend to assume that that's so. Well, I think we know there are a few exceptions, but we know broadly speaking that administrators are not gonna uh, protect the most essential values of uh, uh, academic freedom and integrity. Uh, and that that's gonna be uh, secured, if it is, by faculties and citizens, engaged faculties and citizens. That's been one of the things that we've been pressed to learn, not always successfully, in North Carolina. Most people in North Carolina didn't think that what has happened to us in the last 10 years could happen in North Carolina. We thought we were, you know, we were a different kind of state. Uh, but it's not true. And the sort of, uh, we were talking about this with some students today, the, the, the soft values of constitutional law, for example, those practices and uh, predispositions which undergird our institutions, they have departed almost completely and rapidly in North Carolina. We've seen a lot of them depart now at the national level. They are not as strong as we thought. The bad news about that is we were too complacent. The good news is there's little doubt where the future lies, where progress lies. It has to come from an engaged citizenry who said, this is not the sort of state that we signed on to be. This is not the, uh, the country that we have inherited. This is not the uh, challenge which we accept from our forebears. Uh, we demand more than that. But uh, it's clear, now we have some clarity to it, but we've got to press it ourselves. It's not, it's not going to come from courts. It's not going to come from higher-ups. It's not going to come from private foundations. It's not going to come from running our campuses like businesses. It's going to come only from the engaged demands of faculty and students and those who support them in the broader world. It's the only option. Thank you. Thank you for coming to Michigan. Um, here at the university, public employees have the right to organize and collectively bargain. Um, many of the uh, job families here at the university are organized. Uh, I'm from a, a union where 6,000 nurses here at the hospital are organized. Yeah. That permits us uh, 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 some latitude in uh, talking about working conditions and the such. Um, can you speak to the role? I don't believe this is a possibility in North Carolina. It decidedly is not, and yeah. it makes a huge difference in the quality of our institution, but go but ahead. Can you speak to the possible value of uh, organizing uh, collective bargaining for professors in securing just cause protections under a collective bargaining agreement? Yeah. I, uh, uh, it's odd, I think, but I'm a huge supporter of uh, collective bargaining, both for staff and faculty. I've, I've worked hard in the Virginia system and the North Carolina system where unions are flatly prohibited. So much so that in Virginia, the legislature used to raise hell if I would, as president, I would meet with leaders of the staff. They said, well, that's equivalent to opening the door to collective bargaining. I said, how in the hell are we supposed to run this place if uh, you're not allowed to consult with those who are doing the work. Uh, North Carolina's much the same, a sort of potent aversion to unions, and it hurts staff, and it hurts faculty, and it seems to me it's also true that, like with unions in the workplace, if you're not confident that those who are running the show are gonna be pursuing the most important values, then joining together collectively can be one of the ways to wage war against it. You know, another point I've tried to make in North Carolina, we constantly, as a university, ask for ex exceptions
to the rules which govern public institutions. You know, so if we got a hospital, we want to take some steps to privatize part of it. We want to be free from this kind of uh, 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 budgeting process or this kind of uh, uh, competition in terms of uh, uh, contracts uh, and the like. I say, why don't we ask to be free from the rules which say you can't have collective bargaining? We would say we want collective bargaining, among our, particularly among our lowest paid employees. Uh, we never seem to request that. That's, that's not in the long laundry list of uh, liberties that we seek to pursue. And that's because I think the university thinks it helps them to take advantage of those who have the lowest salaries. So uh, you're lucky that, I think, you're lucky that you have strong traditions of labor in this state, it's understandable where they come from. Uh, not very far down the road uh, here, it seems to me. And uh, like with your fortunate partial independence from uh, the legislature, uh, my recommendation would be that you grab onto both of those things and keep them. Yes? Thank you. Hello. Um, I have an observation, and I'm curious to hear if, if you share it, which is that um, my training is in, in law, and I have found that in general academic scholars in the legal academy are relatively unknowledgeable about academic freedom. They, they know quite a bit about First Amendment issues in general, but academic freedom is a bit off the radar. So it's, it's great that this event is held in our law school, um, but I'm wondering if you, if you share my observation that um, a lot more could be done to engage the legal academy in uh, defending academic freedom yeah. rights. Let and, me say, right here so in this would, room, how would you do it? that the answer is yes, then how would you do it is a much uh, tougher reply. I think it's, uh, you know, there's some quirky things. Academic freedom is not sort of at the heart of the bulk of our intellectual disciplines. It should be, <laughs> I, I mean, in law. Uh, so that it kind of is at the corner between uh, constitutional law and uh, freedom of expression and uh, education law. It's not, as you know from some of the things you struggle with here, academic freedom is not as well developed as, uh, as, a, as a set of legal principles as is the case with uh, a lot of other formulas of expression where we're quite clear about the hesitancy of uh, government intervention. Uh, and sometimes, and this is something I've struggled with a lot the last few years, sometimes academic freedom legal norms might be helpful in some sense, though they're too vague, uh, but you realize you're gonna be squashed anyway if you pursue them. I mean, let's say, let's say that you have a center which has some First Amendment rights, some academic freedom rights, uh, but you have a president, a chancellor, a provost and a board of governors who's going to wage war on them. I'm just telling the future's not good. Uh, it's, you're not apt to prevail in that battle because legal norms likely uh, won't do it. A lot of times it happens, you know this being a lawyer, that uh, when problems become more pronounced, lawyers move towards them uh, and uh, embrace them as uh, more fields of fertile loam. Uh, I think that's apt to be the case uh, in the future. I would say this, you have a great law school here, so, uh, and you also have great challenges of uh, academic freedom and governance, so you ought to engage these folks, uh, pector them uh, a little bit, uh, because they have, uh, this is one of the great faculties in the country, Law, fa law faculties, like other faculties, are not as engaged in the real world as they should be. Uh, this seems stunning. Let, let me give you just one, and I'll stop this. Uh, North Carolina's had a gigantic protest movement going on in the last uh, eight years. I've been very heavily involved in it. It's called the Moral Monday Movement. It has meant, as a result of a lot of things I've talked about, that on several occasions, we have had 100,000 people on the lawn down at the Capitol in uh, uh, Raleigh. That's hard to do. Uh, it doesn't happen unless people are uh, 
are driven to frenzy. Now, about a year into this, the New York Times wrote an editorial which said that North Carolina had lost its mind and that this great protest meeting was going on, this great protest movement, and it was a focal point for some of the challenges that we face in the United States. I'm somewhat known on campus. Now, I'll tell you this, th that day, I got about 35 emails from faculty members at Chapel Hill saying, Jesus, Nickel, did you read this in the New York Times? Did you, did you know this is happening? And I, I said, thank God for the New York Times. Because uh, absent the New York Times, the faculty at the University of North Carolina would have no sense what is happening eight miles down the road with 150,000 people protesting three times a week. Uh, so I wrote a private letter to the New York Times and thanked them for uh, letting us know what was happening in North Carolina. That separation, that polarization, it seems to me takes us away frequently from some of our most vital mission. And uh, I hope it's fixable. I think it'll be fixable by the urgency of the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm greatly honored uh, by this lecture. Thanks for letting me come. Uh, let's, uh, thank you.